Greetings fellow humans, my name is Alistair Lord and I am the Renaissance Yorkshireman. Today is the 21st of September 2021, which means it is the UN International Day of Global Peace. So my message to the United Nations is you're doing a piss poor job of delivering on global peace. I mean, Jesus Christ, just look at the world. I mean, you know, it's a disaster. Um, and my message to everyone who is not a member of the UN and is in fact a normal person who thinks that peace would be better than war is that actually we can have a world at peace uh, without wars. And there's only two things that we need to do. One is we need to have paradigm change of the systems that currently exist on planet Earth. And I'm primarily talking about financial systems and the nature of the state. So that states are smaller and more accountable, but also non-states exist running in parallel. And the second thing we need to do is have personal change. Individuals need to embark on journeys of healing, do their own Jungian shadow work to work out the psychological dysfunctions going on in their head, and then get on with their lives in a happier and more functional manner. And if we can do those two things, we can have global peace. The second international organization that I want to talk about today is the World Economic Forum, or the Davos Group, as they are sometimes called. Now, if you've seen a prime minister, such as Boris Johnson of the UK, or a president like uh, creepy Joe Biden or Trudeau of Canada used the expression build back better then they were given this by the World Economic Forum. They did not come up with it themselves. Now anyone else who you've heard using this phrase build back better is, has almost certainly been given some kind of script and told to do it either directly or indirectly by the World Economic Forum. And on the face of it, the World Economic Forum is not as powerful an international organization as the United Nations. But in my opinion, um, they have a, an awful lot of ideological sway in the world. So although they don't have the kind of in your face power that the UN might have, uh, they have a lot of um, ideological power. Um, primarily in influencing ideological capitalism in the form of most mainstream economists. So the World Economic Forum have stated they want a new normal. And on their website, you can go and read some of their documents. I have, I've been and read many of their documents. And they talk about uh, a manifesto for capitalism 2.0 and they also talk about stakeholder capitalism as if it's some kind of masterstroke of genius that's going to solve the world's problems. It isn't. Um, and their manifesto for capitalism 2.0 is not as good as my book, uh, The Tower of Sustainable Development, A New Post-Capitalist Paradigm, which is essentially a manifesto for post-capitalism. And my manifesto is better than their manifesto, but I don't have hundred, tens or hundreds of millions of pounds behind me. I'm just some bloke who decided, instead of complaining about capitalism, he would write his own alternative to capitalism. Because what else are you gonna do? And build back better is not the only phrase that the World Economic Forum are keen on. They also use the expression, a new normal. And you may well have heard this an awful lot in the last kind of year and a half since the COVID pandemic. A new normal, a new normal, a new normal. Now, funnily enough, I actually believe that they're right. We do need a new normal. But the new normal they're proposing is essentially techno-feudalism. Now, this is not an expression that I've made up. Yanis Varoufakis, former Greek finance uh, minister, came up with this techno-feudalism. And essentially what this is, is the surveillance capitalism and the social credit system of communist China put together. 
So you've got the worst aspects of capitalism, the worst aspects of camp communism put together, and that is their new normal. Now, they say, the World Economic Forum say, you will own nothing and you will be happy. Well, they're half right, because you will own nothing, but you're not gonna be happy. You will essentially be a serf in a feudal system. I like to keep things as simple as possible. And on their website, there are three things that they are not addressing in any meaningful manner. And I think if we address these three things in a meaningful manner, which I do in my book, we can deliver a clean environment, we can eliminate poverty and homelessness, and we can eliminate the, the extremes of inequality that currently exist on planet Earth. Now, not everyone is gonna be equal, but I don't think that's so important, so long as we don't have these extreme levels and we eliminate poverty at the same time and we're respecting our environment, and we can do this. But we have to change the way that we think. The three things that they are not talking about in any meaningful manner is debt-based currencies, the war on drugs, and the military-industrial complex, or the arms trade, whichever you want to call it. So what are debt-based currencies? Well, I've talked about this in some of my previous videos, and I'll talk about it again in future videos, because it's absolutely of fundamental importance. It's absolutely of fundamental importance, and the vast majority of mainstream economists are not talking about it, which is why I would argue that they are ideological capitalists, and they are not evidence-based, and they are certainly not scientists, dismal or otherwise. So with a debt-based currency, what happens is something like this. And obviously this is a little bit of an oversimplification, but essentially it's correct. So a business will go to a bank and say, we want to borrow a million dollars to develop our bank. Or it could be a million pounds or a million euros. It doesn't really matter because almost every currency that exists on planet Earth is a debt-based currency today. So the bank says, fine, we'll lend you a million dollars and we're gonna charge you 5% interest. So that's, you owe us $1,050,000. But here's the thing, the bank create $1 million to spend, but they are also creating $1.05 million of debt. So there is more debt than there is currency, and there is always more debt than there is currency, so that the debt that exists can never be repaid. And this is fundamentally important because the debt grows like a cancer in the world economic system. And with debt-based currency, money is not neutral. It is used as a form of oppression. But don't worry because there are alternatives. Now, if you're interested in this subject, go and read Donut Economics by Kate Rauer. I cannot praise this book enough. It's an absolute work of genius and if mainstream economists were doing economics like Kate Rauer, the planet, planet Earth would not be in the predicament that it currently is with various different environmental catastrophes going on. Not to mention uh, environmental damage done by war and the military industrial complex. But also an alternative money creation system such as copiosis, which I have talked about in previous videos and you can go and look at their website, copiosis.org, actually I think it's copiosis.com. Go and have a look yourself. Don't believe what I'm telling you, go and do your own research. The second thing that they're not talking about in any meaningful way is the war on drugs. So the war on drugs started in 1971, the year I was born. So the war on drugs has been going on since all my life, all my life, the stated aim of the war on drugs, one of the stated aims, was to reduce drug consumption. It has failed. Drug consumption has gone up. Now, although the World Economic Forum are not addressing the war on drugs in any meaningful way, uh, other people are writing quality research about the war on drugs. So, for example, the Human Rights Foundation Centre for Law and Democracy 
have written a, a document called The Cost and Consequences of the War on Drugs. And if you're interested, go and Google it, although other uh, search engines are available, such as Ecosia or DuckDuckGo, um, and they say a number of interesting things. So first of all, the way that the international drugs industry is organised today, and I believe that after the arms trade and oil, it's the third biggest industry on the planet, and it's illegal, um, they say that it's a supply side industry. Now, the thing about this is when there's problems in the supply chain, it tends to impact the most vulnerable, who are the farmers. And according to them, the farmers make less than 1% of the profits of the drugs trade. And also according to this document by the Human Rights Foundation, Center for Law and Democracy, that increasing spending by governments on aggressive military programs uh, in the war on drugs Increase cartel profits. Um, farmers and consumers suffer and are negatively impacted, but actually traffickers and producers benefit. Who knew? But this is not my research. This is coming from the Human Rights Foundation, Centre for Law and Democracy. So go and look it up yourself. Now, if you don't want to do that, but you like watching podcasts, I would suggest watching some of the interviews with Neil Woods. Now, Neil Woods was an undercover drugs police officer in the United Kingdom for 17 years, I think. And now he's a member of LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And he's been interviewed on the James English podcast. He's been interviewed on the True Geordie podcast. He's been interviewed by Sean Atwood. Now, according to him, and he was an undercover drugs officer and was involved in bringing down some very nasty people and putting them in prison, prohibition increases violence. Um, it's that simple. Um, but here's the thing. There's plenty of research uh, and there's plenty of evidence to show that legalization or decriminalization reduces harms, it reduces profits for criminals, and it reduces aggravation for the police, and it's a win-win for society at large. Um, so we've got the Dutch model, and we've got the Portuguese model in Europe. But also, there's the research of Dr. David Nutt. Go and look at the evidence yourself, because it supports uh, a legalisation or decriminalisation approach to drugs, and binning the war on drugs. And just here's... Uh, a, a, a figure to end this particular point on. Since 1971, according to the pre-mentioned document, the United States has spent upwards of $640 billion on, the, on prosecuting the war on drugs. But almost certainly, this is an underestimate. And human rights abuses increase under the war on drugs. And the people who are making money are corrupt politicians, and criminal psychopaths. And talking about the violence of the war on drugs naturally brings us to the military industrial complex or the arms trade, whichever, whichever way you want to put it. And according to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI, in 2019, the governments of planet Earth globally spent approximately $2 trillion on weapons. So what is two trillion dollars? Well, it's a million million, it's a thousand billion, or it's a two with 12 zeros after it. So two, zero, 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 zero dollars on arms. And let's not kid ourselves that, you know, part of that was spent on things like white phosphorus and torture equipment. This is not about peace. It's about imperial aggression and it's about oppressing people. Now, if you're a taxpayer, or even if you're not a taxpayer, but you're just a regular citizen who's not part of a stinking rich billionaire class, it's a loss for you. And it also impacts negatively on the environment of planet Earth. Um, but the people who do benefit are generally one of two types. 
One is the dark triad personality type of psychopathy, narcissism and Machiavellianism because they don't care about things like torture and rape and murder. In fact, a lot of them actively enjoy it. So they're quite happy to go along with the arms trade and involve themselves in it. And the other type of person are perhaps slightly psychopathic or narcissistic, but not really classic psychopaths, but they're willing to throw away their moral compass and either actively engage in the system or turn a blind eye to it. Uh, but actually the vast majority of this, it's a lose. And anyone telling you otherwise is a propagandist. So of that almost $2 trillion, according to CIPRI, 62% of it in total was spent by the United States, China, Russia, India, and the United Kingdom. And of that 62%, 39% of total spending was just the United States by itself. So that's the United States spending a total of almost 40% of global spend on the arms trade in 2019. And Russia, China, India, and the United Kingdom spending almost 25% of total spend. Now, since I talked about the United Nations earlier, those countries may somehow sound familiar to you. That's because the five permanent members of the Security Council are Britain, uh, sorry, the United Kingdom, the United States, France, Russia, and China. So of the five biggest spenders, four of them are permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. Only France comes outside the top five, and I think France comes number six. Germany comes number seven, incidentally. Um, so the idea that the United Nations can be trusted to deliver on global peace is absolutely delusional. Wake up. And incidentally, since I mentioned some figures and I'm from the United Kingdom, um, last year, 2020, according to CIPRI, the UK spent $59.2 billion on the arms trade. Um, I feel safer already. Um, so what are my proposals? What do I propose as a post-capitalist uh, as an alternative to the new normal? Well, let's keep it nice and simple. So those three things that I mentioned. First of all, we bin all debt-based currencies and we replace them with non-debt-based currencies. So for example, Copiosis. And you can go and look at their website, copiosis.com, copiosis.org. Um, I've, I've talked about it in previous videos. Go and look at it yourself. It's a way of creating money without debt. So it is not used as a form of social control, which is inherent for uh, debt-based currencies. But also more broadly, we need to be looking at donor economics. And if all mainstream economists could think more like Kate Rowath, we wouldn't be in the problems that we're in now on planet Earth. Secondly, I propose that we bin the war on drugs. Uh, let's just stop it tomorrow and let's legalize and or decriminalize all drugs. Now, some of you may be going, oh no, there's gonna be heroin dealers and people handing out joints outside secondary schools to seven years old. No, 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 no. Now, decriminalization or legalization does not mean that it's some kind of spazzy free for all. Um, you know, I mean, there are still going to be rules regulating it, just like there is for alcohol. Um, and the evidence is with me. I mean, we can look at the Portuguese model and we can look at the Dutch model in Europe. Um, costs for the police were reduced. Violence has gone down. Um, and less taxpayer money is spent on enforcing really idiotic laws. And actually, drug consumption in Portugal went down when they legalized drugs. And drug consumption amongst pretty much every age group in Holland is lower than it is in Britain. So the cachet of illegality to a certain degree fuels drug consumption. Uh, but don't believe what I'm saying. Go and look at the research of Dr. David Nutt because the research is, the research is in. 
um, you know, decriminalization works, prohibition, and let's call the war on drugs what it is, prohibition, prohibition doesn't work. So here's my proposal. At the moment, we're spending $2,000 billion a year on the arms trade. So why don't we start by spending 1% of that? So that would still be $20 billion, still a lot of money, for the next, let's say, three to five years. Now, I'm willing to bet that if we can get rid of the psychopaths and narcissists in government and implement that, that in three to five years time, the vast majority of the population will look and think, wow, things are better. I know, let's reduce the spend on the arms trade even more, right? And those resources can go into things like regenerating our environment, and they can go into education, and they can go into eradicating poverty. Because if we change the system, we can get rid of poverty, we can have environmental sustainability, and we can have vibrant economies and vibrant communities. We just have to start thinking in a different way. Thank you for giving me your time today. Peace.